And that's the read and transform of G over the projection. Right? And so that's, that's how you get from the values in the target to the data. This thing here is representing the data, the points that you've got in the matrix. Your task is to reconstruct the interior values of G. That's the image that, that, that you want. And so you're going to use the inverse rate of transform. Problem is that if you just do that straightforwardly, the image is blurry because of noise coming from various sources. And so what you do is you convolve that with some appropriately chosen filter. And of course, Pat knows all about this because he uses filters of um, a rather similar kind in, in his brain. Research. So what you can do is reconstruct the value of G using um, the data values that you've got from the experiment. Right. Now, one of the important things about these instruments is that you've got a physical system that I described there with the X-ray images and so forth, coupled with a set of computational processes that are integrated into the instrument. And so what you're doing is stepping down from that theory this discrete level where you can apply the computational processes. And so what you do, you do that convolution process, and then you Fourier transform the results into the frequency. The reason you do that is that convolutions are computationally intensive. You transform into the Fourier domain, they become multiplicative. Multiplications are much easier to do, so you do the multiplications over there. You then inverse Fourier transform back to the spatial domain, and then you compute the first rate of transform. So that, that's a sprint through the basic theory of uh, these uh, approaches. So back to the questions. And let me uh, drop the pace down a little bit. Just uh, talk about what's going on here. So here's uh, the question. What are the differences between the data that you get from empirical observations and experiments on the one hand and data from computer simulations on the other? Now, remind you, what you've got here, and this is the reason why I find these particular kinds of instruments interesting, is that you've got hybrids. You've got a combination of something that is a traditional physical instrument on which you're getting physical data from, together with something that um, is computational. And when these things are calibrated, they're calibrated in what are called phantoms, and you can have physical phantoms, and you can have simulated phantoms. So, uh, instead of putting in physical data that's coming out of the experiment, you just substitute it for simulated data. And the constructed image that you get, if you're calibrating the thing right, the instrument and the algorithms are working okay, you'll get an image that is almost indistinguishable from the image that you would get from a real object. <laughs> so here's a nice test bed for these kinds of things. Now, here's, here's the background. Remember the hierarchy that Pat directed our attention to? Lots and lots of models playing a role in getting from the abstract theory down to the data. For example, you've got Compton scattering, uh, uh, an X-ray that, uh, that starts out uh, on a given ray will be deflected sometimes and picked up by a detector. The detector is off that ray somewhere else. You've got to correct for that. Uh, there are inefficiencies in the detector that have got to be corrected for. This beam harm, that is that uh, low intensity X-rays never make it to the Detectors, so you've got to correct for that. There's noise, which I've already mentioned, and there are many, many others. So there's lots of models um, involved just in appraising the physical processes. Mathematical approximations, you've got to go from continuous random transforms to discrete uh, versions of them. You've got finite rather than continuous uh, Fourier transforms. The filters get truncated after a point, and, and so forth. And then you've got the familiar computational approximations, you've got the truncation error for um, real uh, numbers, uh, precision uh, decisions to make. Uh, you've got the uh, fast Fourier transform approximations. Uh, you've got trade-offs, very important trade-offs, between the amount of computational time you're willing to uh, devote and how much accuracy you want. If there's a patient there, uh, you've got to produce the image. Uh, that trade-off is, is crucially important. And, and the point here is that all of these models are feeding in to your understanding of whether something is, in fact, um, a correct set, uh, a correct model of the data for you to be reconstructing the image of. Um, there are statistical versions of this, but here's the sort of application of perhaps hierarchy to um, another case, very complicated, but all of this goes through in a, uh, a very straightforward fashion. Okay. 
Second question, what's the nature of the relations uh, between the models of the data and, and the actual data? And third question, uh, what does this say about the nature of the So, here's the time to say something provocative, Pat. I knew you would have me that you were talking about <laughs> giving you something to respond to. So here's a quote which mirrors a couple of things that, that Michael Friedman uh, picked out from some of Pat's uh, writings. So let me uh, read this. Said, from a conceptual standpoint, the distinction between pure and applied mathematics is spurious. Both deal with set theoretic entities, and the same is true of theory and experiment. Right, now, um, another of the running themes in, in Pat's paper was his claim that if you want to understand the route from theory to data, formal methods can be employed at each of the steps in that hierarchy. And the details of the design of the experiments for it that were informal are things that philosophers of science should probably stay away from and focus on the things that can be represented sharply. Now, that, 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 that's a fine model, but here's, um, here's a little complication that um, I think maybe uh, we might need to uh, get a bit of daylight between pure and applied mathematics. So I mentioned that uh, computerized tomography instruments are, are hybrids. They generate physical data, and then they go on to data processing. That data processing is, is automated. So see the following situation. Right? You've got a target in there. You've got a purely physical process that leads to uh, counts in the x-ray detectors. These are fed into computational devices, which in some cases, for example, there's out there a wide variety of commercially available chips on which fast Fourier transforms can be performed. Software is being transformed into hardware. So in some cases, what you get is a purely physical process from the input to the output. Now, this is an issue that people in computer science have dealt with for a long time, but I think the philosophy of science have not paid enough attention to it. And it's this. If you can bring to bear this apparatus in a way that is purely physical from the input to the output, but it's clearly applied mathematics in some sense, the kind of things that Pat was emphasizing, the formal representations, pure and applied mathematics, I think perhaps don't obviously apply there. And that a purely physical account of computation is something that we need to say something about. So that's, um, that's the challenge. It's the end of the talk, uh, except for one thing. Um, this guy who used to own a company down the road, who used to end his presentations with, oh, and there's one more thing. Um, there is one more thing here, and it's very important, and it's to say thanks to Pat, and happy birthday.